So after all that, what do I rate the book? <laughs> it was, uh, it, this is a book that shook my confidence in myself. Hi, I'm Josh, and I really appreciate you spending some time with me today. So a couple of decades ago, I read a book called Till We Have Faces by famous Christian author C.S. Lewis, which is a retelling of the ancient myth of Cupid and Psyche. At the time, I absolutely loved the book. I rated it as one of my favorite works of fiction I've ever read, to the point where a few years ago, when I put together a video talking about all of my top 10 favorite works of fiction, I put Till We Have Faces at number 10 on that list based on the memory of how much I enjoyed the book. So, there you go. The end. Have a great day. What? If I talk any more about this book, I'm gonna have to get into religion of all things. Yeah, I know you're the boss to puss, but I'm gonna offend so many people. I mean, people go crazy if I talk negatively about a book that they enjoy. Just look at the comments on the video I made about Shadow of the Torture by Gene Wolfe. I didn't even feel like I was being unfair in that review, and yet the comments that are there now are what remain after I deleted all the truly nasty comments. So, and that was just a book. Imagine I talk about religion on YouTube. That's gonna destroy my channel. Surely I don't have to review every single book I read. I can skip this one, right? Oh, okay, we'll get into it then. I almost never reread books. However, a while back, one of my favorite booktubers, Ellie, from the channel Bibbidi Bobbidi Books, mentioned that she really enjoys retellings of folk and fairy tales. And I said to her, well, I remember years ago I read this retelling of the myth of Cupid and Psyche that was really great and I told her about this book. So she ended up going out and purchasing it and then she came to me and said, hey, you want to do a buddy read on this? And I had never done a buddy read with somebody before so I thought, that sounds amazing, I'd love to do it. So I got my copy off the shelf and we read the book together and thankfully we did because that was the one redeeming aspect of this whole experience with the book. Now the other thing I almost never do is spoil anything in books. However, this is going to be a 100% spoiler filled review because I just don't think this book would be worth your while to read. So I am totally fine in just spoiling everything. If you're not, this is a good time to stop the video because I'm going to go through it all and just lay it all out there. So I think that art reviews, as much as we would like to see them as being objective, they're very much about how this artwork has impacted the reviewer as an individual and how they have seen and interpreted the artwork. So in order to explain how this book has impacted me personally, I need to kind of get into my own experiences with religion specifically. Now I can make an entire video on my spiritual journey because it's been a four and a half decade long journey that has gone from really one extreme to the other over the course of many, many years, very slowly, not suddenly for sure. And to sum it up, basically I was born into an extremely conservative fundamentalist Christian family. And since that's what I was taught from the very earliest ages, since I could even begin to understand such things, I mean, that's kind of a form of brainwashing in a sense, because you are putting these, this worldview into a young child's head and that's what they're growing up with and believing. And so, it becomes difficult then when you become of an age where you can start to critically examine such things and think for yourself. It becomes hard even in the face of new evidence to leave behind this worldview that has been built up in your head from the very youngest ages. So I grew up in this very, very strict Christian environment and I ended up marrying somebody who was raised in a very, very similar background, if not even more strict and fundamentalist than my own upbringing. Now, I was very much into my faith and into theology, and in the same way that I study history and science because I have just an endless curiosity about the world and want to know more about the world around me, as a child and teen, I read theology books and I studied theology. I read the entire Bible cover to cover. I read the New Testament multiple times. I read several books in the Old Testament multiple times, and I really dove into it and studied it a lot. 
So in the course of my own self-study, I realized a lot of areas where what I was taught growing up did not fit with the beliefs that I took out of my own study. And so gradually my own beliefs shifted and changed. In some senses, they became a little bit less strict, but I was still very firmly into the whole uh, Christianity religion and spirituality throughout much of my adult life. But even then, over time, things gradually shifted more and more at a very glacial pace, but change was happening and growth was happening, I think. And now I've ended up in a place in my mid-40s where my own personal beliefs are that if there is a bigger picture in the universe, if there is a god or gods, or if not, then what the kind of bigger picture might be, I think it's possible and even quite likely that there is a bigger picture. However, I believe that the human mind and the human experience are both way too tiny to comprehend even the beginnings of what this bigger picture could be. It's as if the bigger picture was an iPhone and I was an ant. And even if I'm crawling across the iPhone, I wouldn't have even the slightest idea of what this iPhone was or what its potential was or what it was all about. And so, yeah, I believe there could be a wider picture that is just unknowable to us as humans. Obviously, that's entirely different from what I grew up with, but that's kind of where I ended up at this point. Now, if my spiritual journey continues as it has, perhaps in another 10 or 20 years, the, my outlook will be very different as I kind of take in more information and parse it through and kind of think about things on my own. Who knows what I could end up thinking or believing in another 10 or 20 years. And I think that's okay. I, I think it's okay not to be married to a specific belief at all costs and regardless of what evidence is put before you. And I think it's even kind of a scientific approach to life where science will come up with its best theory and then as new evidence is taken in, maybe it has to be adjusted slightly or drastically and then a new thing can be trusted for the time being with what evidence we have until more evidence comes in. And that's just the approach that I like to take even with my worldview at this point, which like I said was difficult to break out of. But now that I have taken that approach, I think I'm pretty happy with my own point of view. So that's just my personal journey. And you will see then as I go through this book, how it relates to the things that are being discussed from a definitely very Christian perspective until we have faces. I mean, no offense, and I will never tell anybody what they should believe because I spent a long time believing that the most important thing I could do in life was to convert other people to Christianity. And in preparing for this video, I even dusted off my old Bible for the first time in years and kind of looked some stuff up there to make sure that I knew what I was talking about still. <laughs> so Till We Have Faces is written from a single point of view. It is a book that is being written by the daughter of a king in ancient times. Think kind of ancient Greece era. She is one of two daughters and her primary feature that is emphasized over and over again in the book is that our main character, whose name is Oruel, is the most hideously ugly person in the world pretty much. So she has just these frighteningly ugly features to the point where as an adult she wears a mask covering her face Every time she goes out in public, anytime she is going to be seen by anybody, she wears a mask to cover her ugly features. Now she has a sister who is described as being very beautiful on the other hand, and ultimately along comes another stepsister who ends up being even more beautiful than her older sister. And she's just described as kind of this most beautiful, perfect child. Oral becomes like a mother figure to her as they are raised in quite an awful household. Her father, the king, is an extremely abusive man. He physically, emotionally, just everything abuses and beats on his kids. And honestly, it was a tough part of the book for me to read because it reminded me much too much of my own childhood and the abuse I went through from my parents as a kid and my father in particular. So that was a little tough for me to stomach as I was reading through that part. Now, ultimately what happens is the kingdom ends up going through this turmoil. There's famines, warfare, the fortunes of the king of this land are falling rapidly. Things are looking quite bleak for them. Along with that, we have this kind of spiritual journey with the characters where they have a god named Ungit, who's kind of the main god of their kingdom. However, they also had captured a Greek slave who became like a father figure to the sister 
sisters and helped to raise the girls very much in place of their really awful father. And he is presented as being kind of the atheist in the story. He rejects all the God, the religions, the spirituality, and really puts forth a very logical, scientific viewpoint of the world and tries to get the girls to see life through that particular lens. However, they can't really leave behind their own spirituality. Now, as things are going badly in this kingdom, the people who are dealing with various illnesses are secretly coming to the palace to meet this youngest beautiful daughter and they feel like that she has some kind of healing powers and so they're bringing their children to her in secret and asking her to heal them and so that's the first time that we start to see this youngest daughter psyche as being a christ-like figure that becomes truly emphasized when the king realizes that my kingdom's falling apart i got to do something drastic i am going to take my youngest daughter and i'm going to sacrifice her to the beast which is i guess some kind of an evil god figure who accepts human sacrifice and they're hoping that the fortunes of the kingdom will turn around as a result. So they take this youngest daughter Psyche, they tie her to a tree, again very Christ-like, and then they leave and they accept the fact that the beast will have taken her and accepted this offering. Now, Orwell, of course, is very upset by all this, the fact that they've taken her youngest sister and left her in this terrible predicament. So she decides she's going to go out on her own, away from the palace, and just at least retrieve her body and give her a proper burial. However, when she gets to the tree that they tied her to, they, she discovers that Psyche is no longer there. And in fact, Psyche appears to her and shows, I am still alive. Not only that, but the god is not an evil god. The god took me to be his own, and I am living in his palace across the river and living, living this wonderful life. And Orwell, however, cannot see all this palace and all these wonderful things that Psyche is talking about. And it becomes clear that because of Orwell's lack of faith, as it were, she can't see the true picture of what Psyche is experiencing. Now, she does see just kind of hints of this palace, or at least a brief glimpse of it, so that kind of in the back of her mind, she knows she's seen something, but she's not willing to accept the truth of it. And so what she believes is that Psyche is unfortunately deluding herself, and she needs to be rescued from that situation. Now, we get more into an Adam and Eve type situation next, because Psyche he says, I'm living this wonderful life with my God husband. However, the one thing I'm not allowed to do is I'm not allowed to see him. So he just comes into our, our room at night when it's pitch dark. We spend our wonderful nights together. And then during the day, I live this lovely life in the palace. So we have this Adam and Eve. The one thing you're not allowed to do is eat fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, of course, Orwell doesn't see any of this. She thinks, okay, Psyche has been trapped. She's in a bad situation. Yes, she is obviously very happy, but I don't think that what's happening is for her own good. So she contrives to manipulate her to remove her from that situation. And she says, well, obviously, if the God was good, he would allow you to see him. And so something very nefarious is going on. And she essentially says to Psyche, if you don't look at the God's face, I'm going to kill my Myself. So that's on you then. And so Psyche feels like she has no choice. And so that night when the God comes into their room, she turns on the lamp, sees the God, and is immediately banished from the palace. She is sent into exile in the world and kind of disappears from the story. Not long after the king dies, Oral's father, and she becomes the queen of the kingdom and we have her entire adult life covered in just a few short pages where it talks about how she was a very just queen. She brought a lot of positive changes to her kingdom. She did a lot of good for her people, but the whole time in the back of her mind was this really burning anger against the gods and what they had done to her family and herself. And we eventually realize that this book that she is writing and that we are reading is being written as her complaint against the gods. So this is how she puts it. She says in chapter 11, And now we are coming to that part of my history on which my charge against the gods chiefly rests, and therefore I must try at any cost to write what is wholly true. And she goes on to talk about her history and her life as it carried on from there. And some of her complaints against the gods are written as follows here. And as far as I'm concerned, they're very legitimate complaints, especially compared to what she has experienced in her life. Now, in talking about this book as a complaint against the gods, it does show that Orwell does believe in the gods, but not in a sense where she has faith in them to 
make her life better or to save her from her situations. So in that sense, she's kind of an agnostic in that she does believe that there are gods, but she is a very bitter agnostic. She does not believe in the good of the gods. And here are some of her complaints. And here she says about her Greek slave, the one who is presented as the atheist figure, she says, he thought there were no gods, or else, the fool, that they were better than men. It never entered his mind, he was too good, to believe that the gods are real and viler than the vilest men. And eventually in my spiritual journey, I kind of realized, yeah, you know, maybe there are gods, but if there are why do we think that they are somehow morally perfect or these 100% good beings? Now we have Orwell who's talking about the priest of their kingdom's god, Ungit. The priest's name is Arnim. And she says, when at last we got down to the open field by the river, there had to be more delays. Arnim was there in his bird mask and there was a bull to be sacrificed. So well the gods have wound themselves into our affairs that nothing can be done but they have their bit. So the gods always want their piece of the pie. Similarly, she says, I say the gods deal very unrightly with us, for they will neither, which would be best of all, go away and leave us to live our own short days to ourselves, nor will they show themselves openly and tell us what they would have us do, for that too would be endurable. But to hint and hover, to draw near us in dreams and oracles, or in a waking vision that vanishes as soon as seen, to be dead silent when we question them and then glide back and whisper words we cannot understand in our ears when we most wish to be free of them, and to show to one what they hide from another, what is all this but cat and mouse play, blind man's buff, and mere jugglery? Why must holy places be dark places? I say, therefore, that there is no creature, toad, scorpion, or serpent, so noxious to man as the gods. And she mentions that even in sleep we can't escape from the gods. Now mark yet again the cruelty of the gods. There is no escape from them into sleep or madness, for they can pursue you into them with dreams. Indeed, you are then most at their mercy. The nearest thing we have to a defense against them, but there is no real defense, is to be very wide awake and sober and hard at work, to hear no music, never to look at earth or sky, and above all, to love no one. And then finally, there's this complaint here. What easier, even, than for the gods themselves to send the whole furley for a mockery? Either way, there's divine mockery in it. They set the riddle and then allow a seeming that can't be tested, and can only quicken and thicken the tormenting whirlpool of your guesswork. If they had an honest intention to guide us, why is their guidance not plain? Psyche could speak plain when she was there. Do you tell me the gods have not yet come so far? And I think these are legitimate complaints not only for Orwell in the story, but for, I guess, us, and maybe for people who believe in a god or gods. So yes, these are Orwell's complaints against the gods. Now, my complaint against this book is how women and the female characters are treated by the men in the book. I mentioned how the daughters were very much abused by their father, and he had just such horrible views on women, but even in the what's presented as the very best relationships, we see some problems from my point of view. Now unfortunately, the way that women are presented in the book, it does align with how I was raised. So in the Christian environment in which I was raised, I was taught to believe that men did the important work in society and women were created to serve men and to advance the interests of their partners and husbands women were not to have leadership roles over men nor were they allowed to teach men so especially in a church environment women were not allowed to have leadership roles or teaching roles, although they were allowed to teach other women and children, but ultimately men were at the top of the totem pole. They were the bearers of wisdom and teachings. And women as wives had to obey their husbands, they had to serve their husbands, and that's just what I was taught. And I, like I mentioned, my wife or my ex-wife grew up being taught the same things, and fortunately by the time I got married I had realized just how problematic a lot of that was, and I sort of had to teach my ex-wife that no, I am not the leader in this household. We are equal partners. We both have an equal say in how things go. And it, it took a bit of time, I think, to kind of get that idea across. But like I said, this is the idea that was presented in the book as well, unfortunately. So we see that 
psyche when she finds herself married to the god in this wonderful, beautiful relationship. She even says this to Orwell, who, like I said, Orwell had been like a mother figure to Psyche and had kind of raised her. And so when Orwell is trying to convince Psyche that she's in actually a bad situation, Psyche says, Dear sister, I am a wife now. It is no longer you that I must obey. The implication being that now she must obey her husband. So it's all pretty awful and problematic and unfortunately it does still carry on to this day in kind of fundamentalist Christian churches. Now, getting back to our story, because we're not at the end yet. So basically, we get through Orwell's entire adulthood, like I said, in a very short period of time, and we get to where she is in old age, and she wraps it up and says, and that's where I am today, and that's why I have these complaints against the gods. The end. Oh, wait. But no, we have a part two where suddenly these people in Orwell's life come to her and make her realize that this whole time that she thought she was doing such wonderful things for her kingdom and her people, in reality she was acting completely selfishly, that she was ruining the lives of those she loved the most and those that were closest to her and using them for her own purposes. And so we're made to believe that because of Orwell's ultimate selfishness and faithlessness that, no, she's not actually a good person, that we can kind of ignore all the great things she has done as a queen for her kingdom and realize that, no, maybe she's not actually such a good person. And then things take a turn for the weird because then she goes to bed one night and we all of a sudden find ourselves in this vision where I guess the remainder of the book is her experiencing things in this dreamlike, vision-like state. So basically Orwell finds herself in this kind of purgatory or almost afterlife type situation where now her father is alive and speaking to her again and that Greek servant who had died is alive and talking to her and, and these other people from her life are now kind of come together in this weird afterlifey <laughs> environment. And so finally she gets to take her document, her complaint against the gods, and she is put in this courtroom-like situation, and she gets to actually formally present her complaints to the gods themselves. So at this point, we get into a very strong parallel with the biblical book of Job. Now, again, as part of my Christian upbringing, I was taught to believe that the entire Bible, Old Testament and New, is, was all historical fact and not ancient Hebrew mythology. And so that's why you get even people today believing that the earth is 5,000 years old or however old it is that they think it is. And so the, the book of Job is an Old Testament book where we have God and Satan just chilling together and God starts bragging for whatever reason to Satan and says, hey man, have you seen my bro Job? He's like the most faithful, most awesome follower I've got. Isn't he just amazing and special? And Satan says to God, well, no duh, he's got like everything he could possibly want. He's got seven daughters and three sons and tons of cattle and sheep and goats and unimaginable wealth and everything he could possibly need. Of course he blesses you and serves you faithfully. Why wouldn't he? He's, he's got it so good. And so then God makes this wager with Satan and says, all right then, you, I'll give you the freedom to take everything away from Job. Just don't touch his body or him, himself. And I'll bet you he's still a faithful servant to me. So Satan's like, okay, fine. And so he brings about the death of all 10 of Job's children. He has raiders come in from another land and destroy his cattle and crops to, and take all his wealth and just leave him with absolutely nothing. And But faithful old Job decides that, yeah, I'm still grateful to God. And so we get that famous line, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And meanwhile, his wife, who I love, says, just curse God and die already. <laughs> Which I'm like, yeah, definitely. That's the way to go. But Job's like, nope, my faith in God is strong and secure. And so God and Satan are hanging out again later, and God's like, hey, well, Job there, he took away everything he's got, and he's, he's still all for me. And Satan's like, yeah, I'll, I bet you, though, if I take away his health, I put him through physical torment, I bet you that'll be the end of him for his relationship with you. And God's like, huh, yeah, I'll take that back. Go ahead and, and do what you want to Job. So Satan goes to Job and causes him horrific, painful illness and just sores head to toe and, and all this horrible sickness. And so now Job is really feeling down in the dumps and his uh, a few of his friends come by to <laughs> lend their wisdom and helping hand and Job's 
starts this long epic complaint against God and says, woe is me, I've been so faithful and God is so unfair and look what's happened to me and starts complaining against God and his friends, being the helpful friends they are, are like, well, obviously you've sinned against God and this is why all this bad stuff has happened to you. It's definitely your fault. Job was like, no, it's all so unfair. Look at the unjustness of God and we get this epic chapters and chapters of Job complaining about a situation, very much like we have Oral with her lengthy written complaint against the gods until we have faces. And then after all this, then God shows up in the picture and God is pissed. He, and <laughs> he says to Job, how dare you speak against me? I'm God. Look at everything I made. I made the world and the universe. And look at the lion and what a magnificent creature it is. And look at the sunrise and the sunset. And he goes on and on, chapter after chapter talking about all the amazing stuff that he's made in creation and how dare you you little piece of nothing <laughs> speak against me to the point where ultimately at the end Joe was like all right all right yep you're right I was wrong to speak against you I'm sorry I shouldn't have said that and so then God is like all right Job I can't stay mad at you I'll give you all your stuff back you can have seven new daughters and three new sons and I'm going to give you twice as many sheep and goats and wealth as you had before and just make life amazing for you and give you a long life to live till the end of your days and I'm like great he got 10 new kids but his 10 first children still died. How, how's he supposed to live with that? But it's presented as being a happy ending in the book of Job anyways. And ultimately, it's so weird to look back on my earlier life because Job was a bit of a hero to me. I grew up in very difficult circumstances. I was abused as a kid. I had Crohn's disease from a very young age, so I lived with this terrible physical illness and pain and lack of physical development and all this stuff. And I was bullied and went through so much horrible stuff throughout my whole childhood. And so I looked at Job as being my hero because he went through all this stuff and yet still held strong in his face. And I'm like, I'm gonna be Job too. But now when I look back at this book, I'm like, my God, this is the worst story of an abusive relationship. I've ever read. We have this all-powerful God and we have Job who's just been through hell. He's lost all his children and is physically suffering so much and is rightfully complaining and God says, how dare you complain against me you little nothing and Job is like, oh I'm sorry, you're right God, I shouldn't have complained and it's just a classic abusive relationship being presented there. All that to say that here we have Orwell in the same situation where she's been through some tough stuff in her life. She finally has her chance to complain against the gods and, well, she is made to feel foolish for even daring to speak against them. Ultimately, Orwell isn't given a real satisfactory answer from the gods and the very last paragraph of the book has this as the conclusion, where Orwell again is narrating and she says, I ended my first book, the one before part two, with the words, no answer. I know now, Lord, why you utter no answer. You are yourself the answer. Before your face, questions die away. What other answer would suffice? Only words, words, to be led out to battle against other words. Long did I hate you, long did I fear you. And so we're not given this satisfactory answer. Uh, what we are presented with, again, is Psyche as being the Christ-like figure. Because in the midst of these visions, Orwell sees that during Psyche's exile on the earth, she went on this kind of spiritual journey where the, the paths that Orwell had to take to reach the afterlife, Orwell or Psyche was always kind of one step ahead of her and helping to make that path easy for her in the same way that I guess in the Bible we're presented with this idea that when Christ was crucified and spent three days in death, he went down to hell and he ultimately conquered death on our behalf. And so we see Psyche doing something similar where she is sort of paving the way for Orwell to safely reach the afterlife. However, until Orwell comes to that place of faithfulness, she is not worthy to stand before God. And that is where the whole title, Till We Have Faces, comes from. And it is finally presented near the end of the book here. And this kind of goes along with that conclusion I just read. It says, the complaint was the answer. To have heard myself making it was to be answered. 
which just doesn't make sense. Lightly men talk of saying what they mean. Often, when he was teaching me to write in Greek, the fox, who was the, uh, their atheist Greek slave, would say, child, to say the very thing you really mean, the whole of it, nothing more or less or other than what you really mean, that's the whole art and joy of words. A glib saying, when the time comes to you at which you will be forced at last to utter the speech which has lain at the center of your soul for years, which you have all that time, idiot-like, been saying over and over, you'll not talk about joy of words. I saw well why the gods do not speak to us openly, nor let us answer. Till that word can be dug out of us, why should they hear the babble that we think we mean? How can they meet us face to face till we have faces? So it's not words and arguments that will allow us to be presented to God, but who we are as people. And this idea that we're not worthy to even face God, to even be in the presence of God until we have reached that place of purity is one of the major sticking points I have with kind of one of the main tenets of Christianity. And I think we're coming around to the main theme of the book here, which is the idea that as humans from a Christian perspective, we are born into a world where sin exists because of Adam and Eve, because they brought sin into the world and doomed all of humanity for all of history to suffer and endure the consequences of sin. But because we as babies are born into sin, this original sin that exists before we even come into the world, we come into the world deserving nothing but death because we are sinners and we deserve to die because sin demands sacrifice. However, thankfully for us, Jesus died on our behalf and all we have to do is believe in him so that we can no longer take that death as punishment but can live eternal life. And that's kind of the basic tenet, I guess, of the Christian faith, which I really have grown to despise the idea that at the core, we are just worthy of death. But thankfully, somebody else came along and if we just kind of put our faith in him, then we are not worthy of that death anymore. And I'm like, what a horrible thing to teach people. I would much rather teach people that they are wonderful, amazing beings who are built out of the elements of dead stars, that life existing in the universe is such a miraculous thing, that intelligent life existing is just unimaginably amazing, that each one of us as humans, as living, breathing beings, are worthy of love, are worthy of kindness, and we're worthy of all the good things. I think that's a much better starting point than being taught that we're worthless sinners who need to rely on somebody else to have any goodness in us. And that ultimately is the teaching point of Till We Have Faith is that we, until we have that faith, that all the words and all the things we do, all the work that Aura will put into creating a good kingdom for her people, it means nothing until you yourself are a faithful, pure person. And I hate it. I hate it. And of course, in the end of it all, the atheist character, the Greek slave, has to admit, oh, I was so wrong. My view of the world was in the ways that I taught you were completely wrong. I'm so sorry. And then our agnostic character has to recognize, oh, I was so wrong with how I approached the gods and life in general. And it was only pure, faithful psyche, our Christ character, who got it all right. So there you go, the atheists and agnostics doing it all wrong, had to admit their fault in the end. Now, can I say a couple of good things about the book? I mean, yeah, it was well written from a technical point of view. Now, it was published in the 1950s, I think, so it does have kind of an old-fashioned turn of phrase in the way things are, are said, and you might have gotten a hint of that when I was reading the passages that I read. So I know that when I read it with Ellie, she said it took some time for her mind to adjust to the style in which it was written, but when she got into the book, it, it was, I guess, I think a more natural read once she got the hang of it. And that makes sense to me. It was kind of the same with me when I first started to read the first couple pages. I was like, oh, that's kind of an old-fashioned writing style. One thing I thought was really cool about the writing style was how the author, C.S. Lewis, gave indications through character conversations about how the characters themselves were acting while the conversations were happening. So here's a couple of quick examples of that interesting writing technique. One character is speaking and says, why, yes, oh child, child, don't cry so. Have I not told you often that to depart from life of a man's own will when there's good reason is one of the things that are according to nature? So it's kind of interesting. We have 
instead of narrating that the child he was speaking to Stu to started to cry, he in the midst of his conversation he pointed out that she was crying. And similarly, one more example of that we have another character speaking who says, "Well, you have a secret from me," he said in the end. "No, don't turn away from me. Did you think I would not try to press or conjure it out of you? Never that. Friends must be free." And so again, it doesn't narrate that the character turned away in anger. We have the character in the midst of his speech saying, no, don't turn away. So I think it's really clever how we're given indications of how the action is happening during the scene when the characters are talking to each other. So after all that, what do I rate the book? <laughs> it was... Uh, it, this is a book that shook my confidence in myself. Now I go back and I look at that video I made about my top 10 works of fiction, and I'm like, how can I trust my own instincts and the things that I have valued over time when I myself have changed and grown so much as a person? Because this was a book that I listed as my number 10 work of fiction of all time. And now I rate the book two out of 10. I'm pretty confident that I've gotten my worst book of the year over with, <laughs> with my first book of 2013. 2013, 2023, I'm 10 years behind. <laughs> I hope this is the worst book that I'll read this year. But yeah, I just, I, I felt embarrassed that I had recommended this book to Ellie. I felt ashamed that this is a book that I had spoken of so highly throughout much of my adult life. And like I said, it shook my own confidence in my own book rating. So anyways, I definitely won't be keeping that book on my shelves. It'll be unhauled very quickly. But let's end on a positive note. Like I mentioned at the beginning, the one redeeming feature of this whole reading experience was the fact that I got to read it with Ellie as my first buddy read ever. And throughout the course of the book, there are other things that are discussed that this review is way too long already, I'm not going to get into, but it does talk about love and acceptance and other people's happiness and how to approach other people based on their own happiness, based on how you think they should be doing things and all that interesting stuff. But Ellie, in the course of our discussion, gave this quote when we were talking about such things, which let me just read it and we'll go from there. So Ellie wrote, it reminds me of that phrase, you cannot truly love others unless you first learn to love yourself, which pops up a lot online. That sentence might seem harmless at first, but actually when you look at it deeper, it can be quite damaging. It suggests that people who are struggling with mental health issues, example, trauma, low self-esteem, depression, etc., all of which are me, are unlovable a feeling that I have, which just isn't true. Mental health issues can of course make dif relationships difficult, but it doesn't prevent you from being a compassionate person and from being able to love. Neither does it stop others from being able to love you. People are more than their flaws or their mental health condition, and I actually think being in a truly loving and supportive relationship can help you learn to accept yourself and recognize the positive things you bring to life. Whoa, she, she really can't have any idea of what an impact that little paragraph had on me, just how deeply it gets to the core of some of my own personal struggles over the last few years. So thank you, Ellie. Please, all of you, check out her channel, Bibbidi Bobbidi Books. She is just so sweet, so lovely, such a wonderful person, and just makes such great content. So please check her out. And thank you for watching my video. If you enjoyed it, please give me a thumb up. If you did not enjoy it, please go ahead and give me a thumb down. And don't just do that though, go into the comments and tell me what issues you had. And maybe we can talk about them as long as they're done in a relatively constructive way and they're not downright nasty because otherwise I'll just delete them. But I'm definitely open to constructive criticism and hearing opposing viewpoints. I think all of us need to be more open to hearing other people's viewpoints. And I am certainly prepared to have interesting discussions if anything that I talked about here brought something up, please do get down in the comments and let me know. Otherwise, I'm just interested in hearing what you've been reading lately. Cheers. It's by the famous Christian author. But, I mean, look. <clears throat> the kingdom goes through... The kingdom and... And Orwell becomes the... the
and I married somebody who was, and I mean, mar on a very, at a very, was, grow, grow up believing. So basically, we get through Orwell's entire adult. And so we're made to believe that because of Orwell's ultimate self and malnourishment and mal and and that is and I think that 